Howdy, this is Jim Rutt, and this is The Jim Rutt Show. Listeners have asked us to provide pointers to some of the resources we talk about on the show. We now have links to books and articles referenced in recent podcasts that are available on our website. We also offer full transcripts. Go to jimrutshow.com. That's jimrutshow.com. Today's guest is Mark Burgess, an independent researcher and writer. Hey, Jim, good to meet you in virtual. Yeah, great to have you on. Really interesting uh, background. Mark started out as a theoretical physicist and then became a technologist, a scientist in other fields, and an advisor to public and private organizations globally. He is perhaps best known as the author of CF Engine, the first industrial grade configuration management systems for large computing installations still used by some big companies. He's also what I might call a practical philosopher. I don't know if he'd like that term or not. We'll find out with his development of promise theory, which we'll discuss here today. And yeah, he uh, writes music, composes fiction, and thinks about money. Woo! (laughs) (laughs) So let's start out just a little bit about your background. What caused you to bail from physics? Uh, Money. You're You're talking about money. I finished my PhD. I went to Norway, of all places, to mainly to go skiing, I I should tell you, but uh, skiing and mountaineering. But there was a a postdoc in physics in that. And I had a couple of years worth of postdoc money from the Royal Society, which ran out sometime in uh, the mid-90s. And then it was a kind of a low point in in research funding. So I had to uh, find other sources of income. And after waiting on the corner with my cup for, for a while, nobody gave me any money. So I I decided to move into my hobby at the time, which had sort of become uh, computer science at that point. That's great. You know, I'm involved with the Santa Fe Institute and have been for many years. And at SFI, we have lots of physicists turned, as I call them, imperialistic invaders of other fields. <laughs> and they do great. What do you think makes physicists such good generalists? That's a great question. I um, I think it's the you know the tool set that we have in physics is an amazing tool set. Going back, I mean, all the way to Euclid, I suppose, and and or Pythagoras, even for that matter, just the way of looking at the world and and trying to quantify it, and at the same time having both quantitative and qualitative ideas about it, and being able to put these into a story and tell that story in different ways. I think that's a general skill which. Perhaps other areas of knowledge have not been able to practice in, with so many deep thinkers throughout the years who've taught us great ways to go about it. So I, I like to think that um, physicists are just great storytellers and are able to apply their thinking to stuff that happens. You know, that's my definition of physics is the study of stuff that happens. Yeah, that's the, you know, the, the concept of the physical, right? Something that really happens. So something I've noticed when I went out to SFI as a junior researcher after I retired from business is I found that physicists above everybody else are able to think in terms of the simple. And, you know, one of the things I took away from my time at SFI is that complexity really arises from simplicity. And in many fields, people tend to jump in at too high a level of complexity and not start with the simple. Uh, does that make any sense to you? Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. <clears throat> you know, Fein, Richard Feynman had a famous rant about philosophers. I'm not going to repeat that, although I agree with a little bit of it. I'm not, I'm not as anti-philosopher as, as he was, but when I read philosophy, and I do read quite a bit of philosophy when I can, uh, what I find is that they tend to throw everything up in the air and try to catch everything, whereas a physicist will throw some stuff up in the air and try to see the essential pattern and then just throw everything else away and and just look at that and then focus in on it narrow in on it uh you know eliminate 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 approximate 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 and just keep doing that until some some simple essence remains and it, it's boiled down to a a perfect diamond yep and then go back up right uh, particularly the imperialists who invade biology or uh, anthropology they say all right let, let's make sure we start with the simple and then from the simple we can grow upward well enough on that let's jump into the substance here let's start with cf engine 
As I understand it, it was a precursor to today's configuration management systems like Puppet and Chef, and even can be considered an ancestor to uh, Kubernetes, or however the hell you pronounce that. Yep. (laughs) What insights led you to create CF Engine? That way, yeah, that's another story which came about from my dilly dallying around physics, which was um, when I went to when I came to Oslo for my skiing and mountaineering and physics. I got involved with installing the computers as as one does, and uh, for a while it was interesting to me to learn everything that I could about these machines and make them work and automate them and. and observe how these processes talk to one another across the network. It was all fascinating to me. And um, that was fun doing everything by hand for a while to learn. I like to get my hands dirty when I learn a new field. But uh, after a couple of months, then suddenly it wasn't so fun anymore to be doing this, uh, having people knocking at the door in my office and saying, Mark, could you, could you just do this for me? And could you just do that for me? And could you fix my computer? You know how it goes. So um, I thought being, um, you know, an ardent fan of science fiction and and technology, wouldn't it be cool if I could actually write a kind of an AI system that could manage the thing for me or get the computers to manage themselves? It seems to make a lot of sense because, after all, you should always let your tool do the work, as my former gardening boss used to say when I was working there in a summer job. Always let your tool do the work. He instilled into me this ethos that um, let your tools do the work. So instead of humans running around after computers, fixing everything for them, nursemaiding them and fixing every little detail, you should get the machine to do it all by itself because how hard could it be, right? So I, uh, I sat down and tried to write some scripts in Perl and Shell and all of those old languages. And, and the guys at Oslo University have to give them credit because they were some amazing imaginative people who were very early on making uh, script-based automation in Unix. I looked at their stuff and thought, this is cool, but what we really need is a much simpler way of doing it, that simplicity again. And the thing I observed was that when they wrote scripts to try to automate software, they had all of these if-then-else statements. If this is an HPUX machine, or if this is an an AIX machine, then do this with this extremely long command with lots of different uh, options added. Whereas if it's a Sun Microsystems machine or an Apollo workstation, then do this with another set of different commands and different um, options added. And there were so many variations of this that it became a litany of incredibly enormous branching complexity which was just untenable after all. First of all, it was unreadable, incomprehensible, and impossible to maintain. So I thought, you know, what what should really happen is that an intelligent agent should wake up and say, okay, where the heck am I? What What's my environment? What kind of operating system is this? What kind of things are going on? How shall I adapt to this situation? And then you should be able to specify as a kind of a policy in a high-level declarative way what you intended the state of the machine to look like. What's it supposed to be doing? What kind of security settings should we have? Who are the allowed users and so on and so on. And then just simply make that happen. Turn that into the desired end state of the system. Manipulate a kind of a curved space time that you would just sort of roll into this black hole of perfect configuration and the system would simply configure itself by magic or by technology. So that, that's how it got me started on CF Engine. I wanted to make that super cool uh, AI-based reasoning system that could investigate its surroundings, adapt to them, and then set to work at adapting them and changing them and manipulating them. You've also mentioned in the context of CF Engine something called the maintenance theorem, a theory that looks to me like policing and equilibrium by detailed balance. Could you tell us a little bit about the maintenance theorem and how it relates to CF Engine? Yeah, so um, because being of a physics background, uh, after a while I, I started looking at the computer on my desk. And you know, and for our readers, uh, I can explain that my, my background is in quantum physics. Uh, I started out with in quantum gravity quantum field theory, and um, actually worked even looked a little bit at complexity theory in the 80s when that was uh, becoming a thing. 
But um, <clears throat> because I wanted to look at the world in terms of these nice uh, descriptions of, of all things communicating and, in, and interacting, I looked at the computer on my desk and said, shouldn't I be able to understand this computer, not as a machine, but as a phenomenon? And the standard story in computer science is kind of computers do what we tell them, right? We, we program them and then they do exactly what we tell them. And anyone who's ever worked with computers ever knows that that is an extremely optimistic, idealized idea uh, about what computers might do on a good day. But uh, I figured, well, we ought to be able to look at these things as a phenomenon that are somewhat unpredictable now because we've connected them to a network. It's no longer just what we program them to do, but it's what other people elsewhere program the neighboring computer to do and what it's doing to our computer and how they're sharing resources and so on and so on. So there's a computer program, any kind of process is actually taking place in a highly complex environment of different multiple overlapping processes, sharing resources as a commons and as in competition with one another. And this is influencing every computer program. We can come back to this because it's really interesting uh, measurements that we did around this. Um, and that means that all of the time, in spite of your best laid plans of mice and men of the desired end state of this computer, the programs you're trying to run, things are going wrong all the time and need to be corrected. Things falling out of whack, programs crashing, need to be restarted, running out of disk space, memory, et cetera, et cetera. All of these things can be corrected fairly simply, um, even by a machine, just observing and maintaining, if you know what the proper state of the machine is supposed to be. So I took this idea of the intended state of the computer, what's intended by the system. And this, this idea of intent comes back many times as a theme. And I wanted to uh, create a system which could, every time it went out of whack, I'd whack it back in like whack-a-mole in a kind of detailed balance. And out of this, I came up with this, this theorem, which is essentially a, a rebranding of Shannon's um, error correction theorem, which says that you can set aside a certain amount of resources in your system to correct errors, assuming that you know what the correct state of the system is, you can correct those errors to that proper state simply by reiterating the desired policy again and again. And then I sort of reformulated that in symbolic terms for a dynamical system. And the computer is a dynamical system with symbols as well. So um, and that turned into this thing, which I called the maintenance theorem, which is, as you exactly say, is a kind of policing of the desired state as you've defined it your policy for the system, and it works in a dynamical way as a detailed balance. That's very interesting. In 1998, you wrote a paper called Computer Immunology about competitive maintenance and homeostasis in large-scale computing. Homeostasis is something that I find very central to how I think about the world. Could you say more about that perspective and how has it aged? You know, that, that's, uh, that was a really funny story because it was the very first time I went to the United States, in fact, was in 1997. I went to a conference and I talked about CF Engine. I presented my burgeoning tool there. CF Engine was from 1993 and it developed as an open source project for a few years. And then I was invited to the Lisa conference, which is in beautiful, uh, sunny San Diego. And I, I gave a, a talk about this detail balance idea and uh, it was a huge conference, lots of people. And and after my talk, a bunch of guys came up to me and they said, oh, this is very interesting. So it's like, so what is this? It's like a, a, an advanced form of cron. Cron is a scheduling agent in, in Unix for the for our readers. And I, I went back very dejected and, and thought they didn't understand a word of what I was saying. So I spent that year actually trying to figure out uh, how to explain this idea of detailed balance and maintenance in systems, automated maintenance. And on the plane going home, this is a true story, uh, going home on the plane, I actually got sick. I came down with some flu on the plane or whatever. And I came up with this idea of the immune system as an analogy of this idea of detailed balance where 
your body in some sense has a policy for what is an, a healthy ideal state. And when it goes out of that balance, some monitoring system picks up on that and then tries to restore it to that state by eliminating invading pathogens and whatnot. Not only invading pathogens, of course, but regulating the heartbeat and the blood supply and oxygen levels and all of these kinds of uh, temperature things and whatnot. So this idea of regulation, both dynamically in terms of rates and, and um, temperatures and so on, but also symbolically in terms of are you an allowed pattern of DNA or are you an allowed antigen in my system? This was a very interesting um, idea to me, and I wanted to use that as an analogy to explain my idea. And at that time, there was, I don't know if you know, but there was um, a very interesting lady called uh, Polly Matzinger who came up with a theory of immunology called the danger theory, uh, which was kind of a counterpoint to this idea of self, non-self in the immune system. And her idea was that... Uh, Self-non-self -self distinction is quite a hard computational problem. It doesn't make a lot of sense in terms of evolution. Uh, but if you could detect danger signals, that's a much easier thing to, to detect because in the body, when, when cells die badly because of attack, they tend to uh, die by necrosis. They, you know, they burst apart and they leak all of their innards in some horrible mass inside, and those those bits of protein are easy to pick up on. That's what your immune system picks up on. Whereas um, if cells die properly by programmed cell death, when they're just shutting down, your, your computer program is just shutting down, it's finished its job and so on, then they die, they die by this programmed cell death, and, and that's a, a clean business. So there is a simple computational algorithm, if you will, for detecting bad circumstances over good circumstances. And I wanted to try to apply this idea to my CF engine. I already had the symbolic part, um, but then I realized I could add the dynamical part. And that's what got me into machine learning and uh, threshold detection, adaptive systems, and so on. So I went and I, held, I gave this paper called Computer Immunology. And the guy came up to me afterwards and he said, oh, do you know this group at the Santa Fe Institute? And... Um, uh, University of New Mexico, Stephanie Forrest's group, who have been working on computer immune systems for security. And I hadn't heard of them, but it, it turns out we got to know each other a little bit and uh, exchanged some papers. So that was a fun thing. I was going to point out, if you hadn't made the connection, that Stephanie Forrest has been working in this area for a long time. And, and she's certainly somebody who's worth looking at their work. All right. So let's go from kind of the theory idea to the, a little bit more practical. What's your view of the current state of play of configuration management? You know, I see uh, the Kubernetes or whatever the hell you call it. How do you pronounce that, by the way? Uh, I say Kubernetes. I think it's uh, it's a Greek word. It means the steering, the steersman, the rudder of the, of the system. Okay, that sounds good. Anyway, I see Kubernetes everywhere. I think the last time I personally fooled with any of this, we used Chef back in 2013. You know, as a guy who's had his uh, you know foot in this category for, for a long time, what's your thought of the state of play of configuration management? Great question to ask me. A bit controversial as well, because this I think people's understanding of this has changed over time. It, you got to understand that back in the beginning when I started in 1993, 100 machines was quite a lot. And then it was 1,000 machines was, was quite a lot. And then it was 10,000 and 100,000. And now we're up to millions. But along the way, the way we manage that, those numbers and the way we manage complexity has changed a lot as well. So in the beginning, computers were simply what we call bare metal, the raw computer running programs directly on the operating system. But along the way, we introduced virtual machines to try to manage the capacity of machines better, to share workloads between different processes while maintaining some kind of secure separation between them. And we've been building layer upon layer of this virtualization on top of machines. And that's kind of changed the way we need to configure systems because each layer needs its own configuration to manage it. CF Engine was designed for, again, because of my background, I, I designed it for 
extremely large scale and for extremely diverse environments. You know, I was working in a university, and as you know, all university guys are special kids. They they have special needs. They won't take on a kind of an industrial approach, like let's make everything the same to keep it simple for the managers. No, no, no. They need their own special way of doing it and their own particular programs and then their own settings. So turns out we needed to do every, every department at the university totally different. And that having a system that could adapt to those differences and still maintain them at scale turned out to be a good precursor for what the cloud was turning into with this kind of multi-tenant uh, environment where all kinds of people have different needs overlapping. So CF Engine was designed to be this very flexible and highly scalable thing running on bare metal. And later it could be adapted to these other, other scenarios. And then uh, Puppet came along and did a similar thing in a way that was more kind of um, user-friendly to the system administrators. People found CF, my CF engine a bit too academic, I suppose. They found a Chef to be more friendly and more programming worthy. So was, those guys took a different, a more programming kind of uh, approach to to um, to configuration. Then along comes Kubernetes and Docker and these so-called containerized systems where you had a new way of packaging software where you could deploy software along with all of its attendant dependencies and all of the things it depended upon as a single package or as a set of related packages. And all of the configuration could be kind of baked into it in advance. And this allowed programmers to, to set up the configuration and maintain it themselves if they could control the process and reset the process, kind of like doing control alt delete on the process, but in the cloud. And that kind of changed the way that people managed systems altogether. So they didn't need to have an immune system anymore hunting down these, these problems. They would simply let stuff die. This is now going back to that biological idea of necrosis, if you like. If the system dies badly, well, just make sure you had enough cells to begin with. And if you lose a few cells, it doesn't matter. You've still got plenty to back up. And then just make some new ones. Just let them split up and, and make a few more copies. So there was actually this shift from a, a quite rigid and keenly maintained fragile system that needed to be maintained and, and repaired in real time by detailed balance to a kind of a, an approach using redundancy Let's just set up a whole bunch of things in advance. And if we lose a few, no matter, we'll just start a few more. And um, the, the users will probably never notice. Because the thing that had changed in the meantime was the web. You know, everything was coming online and web-based systems were built around this client-server architecture, which is very much, um, if we lose touch with the server, we just reconnect and try again. So everything's based on trying again, redundancy, do it again, keep doing it until it works. And that sort of is a kind of a repair loop in its own right. And that allowed people to change the way that they manage systems. And Kubernetes was kind of the answer to that. But the self-healing aspect of CF Engine was built into Kubernetes now, not at the level of individual process attributes, but more at the level of these um, entire packages of systems managing software. I must say, I love Docker. You know, I like to play around with various technologies. And Docker has lowered the threshold to be able to play around with some fairly advanced technology by a tremendous amount. You know, as you said, you no longer have to build the environment yourself. You'd say, all right, just give me this complete canned environment, bring it down, fire it up in Docker. You know, say, learn to play with TensorFlow or something. And when you're done, delete it. And, you know, instead of it being a couple of days to come up to curb, you might be actually writing a program in an hour. Quite remarkable. The other thing I like about Docker and similar revolution is how much more efficient it is. You know, the layers of virtual machines was an unbelievable suck on performance. And people are still adding those layers, by the way. I mean, it's not, it's not ending anytime soon. This could be, uh, you know, actually I make myself unpopular in the IT industry by talking about the next climate crisis. And we as IT developers and designers uh, should 
think more about the resources we use because the IT industry actually passed, as many people know, passed the airline industry for its carbon emissions some years ago, and it's only getting worse. And when blockchain came out, of course, that's um, now melting one ice cap a week or something like that just to exchange some dollars between people. Yeah. Ben Gertzel, my good friend and AGI researcher, he likes to say about the uh, proof of work idea in Bitcoin, really all it's doing is accelerating the heat death of the universe, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. All right. Let's uh, switch directions a little bit here. And, you know, from your practical work in CF Engine, you know, at least I can see, you can tell me if I'm full of shit or not, you develop promise theory. Tell us about promise theory. And uh, maybe if there actually was a relationship to what you learned from CF Engine and uh, where it went from there. Promise Theory actually did come out of uh, my experiences with CF Engine. You know, I wrote CF Engine again in 1993, pretty much by intuition. I had no idea what I was doing. I just had some idea of how it should probably work using some of my physics experience or background, I suppose almost a thermodynamic or statistical mechanics approach to management. Um, and then, as I mentioned to you, I, I got into the theory of, uh, of computers and I wanted to understand computers as a kind of a physics of what, what would be a physics of computer networks. And being a good physicist, of course, I immediately tried to apply all of the tools that I knew, differential calculus, statistical mechanics, and on and on all of these classical quantitative methods. And uh, I tried to write, um, I was making a, a master's degree actually at the university at the time, and I wanted to write a textbook for, for this. So I was trying to put down everything that I could think of. And I tried every theory you can imagine to, to try to analyze computers in a, a helpful way. Graph theory, game theory, queuing theory, statistical mechanics, set theory, you know, on and on. And uh, I wrote this book and made a few um, steps forward here and there, I would say. But at the end, I was feeling pretty disappointed in the amount of sensible predictability that you could get out of computers. It turns out that there are very few predictable patterns in computers. The only one happens in very, very busy servers. And then it turns out that servers actually look a lot like the heat spectrum of uh, black body because network traffic turns out to have this kind of um, a black body radiation-like signature, which being a physicist, I could recognize. But that was one tiny little uh, thing that we could observe by applying traditional physical methods. But I suppose by the end of that, I realized there was one thing missing and that was intent. Now, when we make technology, it's not just uh, a bunch of things, random things interacting and competing. We, we make something to perform a function. Uh, a process has a role to play in a larger functional system. Same is true in biology, of course. Although it's not designed, it's, it's honed by the forces of selection to play a particular role in a functional system. But this notion of functionality, I think, was a huge missing piece not only in my work, but actually in, you could even say in modern science, we've shied away from this notion of intentionality because going back to our philosophers, people tend to think intentionality assumes the idea of free will. We have to have intelligent beings or something of this nature. And I think what I, what I successfully showed with applying what eventually became promised theory is that we don't need to bring up this notion of free will to talk about intent. We can define the idea of intent simply as um, a set of possible outcomes. What are the possible pathways forward, the causal pathways forward that a system might take? And those different alternatives are equivalent to the different intentions you could have for the system, because it's no good hoping and wishing for things that couldn't happen. Um, of course, you you can wish for them if you like, but but they won't they won't come about. So you can eliminate them in some way, and and this told me that there would be some process of things that could happen and things that would select them. A little bit like you have mutation and selection in evolution, but in any kind of process in which something is 
developing causally in time, you would have things that could unfold and things that could prune that tree of alternatives. And this led me into the notion of what I eventually called promises. And promises form a kind of a graph between a selection of nodes in which nodes are the active things in a system. They might be computers, they might be processes, they might be cells in biology or people for that matter. And the important thing about computers that I had understood from from looking at these so-called black body spectra was that, in fact, the largest uh, influence from the environment on our computer systems was humans. So it makes no sense to speak about um, uh, computers in isolation from humans. We have to speak about human computer systems. And that overlap, that interaction between humans and computers forms a statistical, what in physics we would call a, a reservoir or a bath, a thermal bath, if you like, of, of interactions between humans and the machine, which drives it much as physical systems can be driven. You can drive oscillators and it drives it as a kind of an external boundary condition in such a way that it steers the system in a number of ways on a small scale by rather strict programming constraints. It can make selections of outcomes in a symbolic fashion on a much larger scale on the statistical level, if you will, it can steer systems towards using certain resources or competing with one another instead of complementing one another. And that can cause systems to crash or to go into nonlinear behavior, behavioral modes, uh, unfortunate feedback loops, and, and so on. And trying to combine all of these things into a picture of that combine both the dynamics of the system with the semantics or the intent behind it led me to a kind of a network view of the world, which also was fed into by network science, which you guys from Santa Fe know all about as well. And promise theory, you could say, is a kind of a generalization of network science, um, which can describe systems from the smallest scale to the largest scale. Turns out that scaling became an enormously important issue. Very cool. Good introduction. Let me drill down a a little bit into some of the specifics. One of the things that you do throughout the book, or at least quite a bit in the book, is contrast the idea of obligation and the idea of promise. Uh, Could you expand on that a little bit? Yep. This became my um, favorite subject. In, In computer science, of course, you have this this history or, or tradition of using logic to try to explain things. And, and logic, again, for our readers, is a very constrained form of mathematical reasoning. Logical systems are, I would dare to say, even over-constrained at times. There are so many uh, constraints on a logical system that the outcome can only be either true or false. This was actually, uh, and people often call that Boolean algebra. In fact, George Boole back in the day was entirely aware that there could be a whole range of possibilities between true and false, which are uh, taking on board the idea of uncertainty. And in his writings, he actually wrote zero and one, as we sometimes do today in computing, and all of the values in between for, for different levels of certainty where one is truth, absolute certainty, and zero is false, absolute uh, certainty in the not of truth, if you will. And that's actually a form of obligation. When you design computer systems and say, you must have this outcome or that outcome, and you must produce this or, or, or that, this is the notion of obligation, which is also called deontic logic, or it's a form of modal logic. And as my friend and and, uh, collaborator, Jan Bergster, who co-wrote the Promise Theory book with me, likes to say, uh, and he is a a logician by training, in the 50 or 60 odd years of of deontic logic, there have been almost no useful results. And the reason for that is that logics of obligation are quite inconsistent. If you have two agents and they try to impose on a third, you know, one says, you say tomato, and the other one says, you say tomato. 
And that agent in the middle has no way of resolving that conflict because the conflict arose elsewhere in these two other agents. And it has no power over those the source of those obligations. So obligations are fundamentally hard to resolve because obligations come from without rather from within. What I realized was uh, something that's important in physics, especially in, in quantum physics, and that is the notion of locality. That if you only base descriptions of system on what happens from the location at which a property is asserted, that property comes from within, then you can always resolve conflicts. Because if I say to you, tomato or tomato, that might be inconsistent, but I can choose one or the other and decide which of them I want to go with. And I am able to detect that inconsistency myself. I actually used this idea in CF Engine to detect conflicts of policy. So if, if a user had tried to say, I want this program to be switched on, or I want it to be always switched off, that's a conflict. And it's clearly resolvable as long as that policy comes from the same source. My computer can decide for itself whether it wants to do it or it doesn't want to do it, and it can choose between them. But if those obligations come from without, then they will simply compete to try and switch it on, switch it off, switch it on, switch it off, and there'll be a, an endless um, competition between the two, which is destructive. So this idea of promise captures the notion of what we would call locality in physics, where rule-based systems can be completely consistent uh, and have proper resolutions versus systems where things are imposed from without, or if you like, have contradictory external boundary conditions and will forever be in competition with one another. And that allows you to build a notion of stability, which is, again, another way of saying this, uh, this idea of a, an immune system. What an immune system does is it creates semantic and dynamical stability in a functional system. And that's what we wanted to try to achieve for computers as well. And I think that's what you can say the state of modern management has really taken on board that idea uh, in, in the way that we do things today. Yep, I really like the uh, what I'd I thought of as the base level of simplicity that only an agent can make promises of itself, right? And as you pointed out, the, the number of contradictions that the system has is much less when only an agent can make a promise about itself rather than having various agents trying to put obligations on each other. However, as you pointed out, this results in a kind of relativity problem right? In that any agent can make its own sometimes contradicting assessments of whether a promiser, another agent, fulfilled the promise or not. So what are the implications of what I might call that information relativity? Yep, exactly right. Um, <clears throat> so, of course, this is super interesting for me because this goes right back to the, the, the huge shift that happened in uh, physics in the 20th century from this Newtonian view of the world in which the universe is kind of an obligation imposed by God. These these laws of physics are almost like a, a handle that God is turning with his own hand and driving the universe deterministically into this picture first picked up on by Einstein, which showed that actually what you see in the universe depends very much on where you are and what you're doing at the time and which processes are available to you, which ones you have information about. And that introduced the idea of the communication or the channel of information between a source and a receiver, the phenomenon being observed, and the, the user of that phenomenon or the observer of that phenomenon. And in a computer network, of course, this comes about all the time because computer networks are built on the idea of services and clients. A server will will say, serve up web pages or a database or or something of this nature, and a client will be trying to observe the database or pull out the, the results of that service from a different location entirely. So you have one local system which knows all about its data, and then you have another system on the other side of the planet, perhaps, trying to observe the data from a distance, possibly through multiple different routes through the network, different pathways. And 
all of those problems that uh, emerged in 20th century physics are now re-emerging in the computer network. The, f- the idea that messages can take multiple paths and interfere with one another, the idea that um, certain information could uh, be reversed in its order because uh, traveling along one path, the speed of communication is different from the speed of communication on another path, allowing inconsistencies to arise. And if you try to impose com- collaboration between systems by obligation, by pushing data, you can easily find that those obligations, those impositions of of data turn out to be absolutely inconsistent and unresolvable. Uh, whereas if you take the opposite view, which is the, the Einstein observer view, the local observer view, that each observer makes obs- observations of its own accord and promises to resolve conflicts or differences that it sees by its own hand, as it were, then it becomes up to the observer to resolve those difficulties and find the intended outcome. Now, this is interesting on a number of levels. First of all, it implicates Shannon's theory of communication, which was uh, the idea of having a sender and a receiver. The sender will send a certain message and the receiver will try to receive it, but the receiver may be either unable or unwilling to receive the message. It might be distorted. It might be in a different language. The resolution of the receiver might be unable to discern the different symbols. There might be errors. It might be encrypted uh, again, on and on. So what is promised by the source of a a message or service, uh, an observation, is not necessarily accepted or received by the receiver. And this adds an additional degree of freedom in promise theory that is somehow related to this notion of source and receiver in, in, uh, in Shannon's theory, what he would call the overlap of mutual information. And interestingly, it's also analogous to the offer and acceptance of the wave function in quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, we have this curious um, reformulation of physics in which what originates from a physical system is then collapsed onto a set of eigenstates or potential outcomes like these pathways we were talking about earlier, these intentions, these intentional outcomes, if you will, which are represented as so-called mathematical eigenstates in, in quantum mechanics. And that matching between the two is almost like the acceptance of or the overlap function between what is transmitted and what's received by a receiver with a limited number of degrees of freedom, which is analogous to what Shannon thought of as an alphabet of possibilities in the theory of communication. Now, when you try to build this into a system, you find that this this additional degree of, uh, of freedom between offer and acceptance plays now an important role in the semantics of the system we use that to our good intent, for example, in security. We, will I grant you access to my, my system or not? You may try to impose information on me, but will I accept it or not? Nope, I'm going to filter your packet on the network even though you sent it to me. I'm, I don't want to hear that. I want to filter out all of, all of the fake news from Facebook. I want to I have a policy about this and that. And the same thing works both on receiving requests to supply information at a server, and it applies once the server replies with it with data in the other direction. So there's a kind of a filtering which goes on between sender and receiver. Again, as a physicist, what I find interesting there is that that, that filtering has the analogous role to the, the Hermitian operators that you insert into the quantum mechanical wave functions in quantum mechanics to to extract certain properties of the system uh, in a consistent way. So there's this absolutely fascinating thing that's happening in, in cloud computing because of all of the layers of virtualization that are taking place. And that is that as we get closer and closer to a virtualized world of processes interacting, we're getting closer and closer to seeing these very bizarre phenomena that have confused us in quantum mechanics, perhaps for a similar reason or perhaps for a totally different reason, of course, we don't truly know. 
But that, that idea, which goes back to Newton, that similar phenomena may have similar explanations, opens an intriguing possibility, which is that we may be able to learn something about quantum systems by actually looking at how our technology now exhibits phenomena that seem somewhat uh, counterintuitive, but at the same time, somewhat familiar from quantum mechanics. Very interesting. Let's bring it down one level of abstraction. That was very, very deep. But let's bring it down a, a level or two or three of abstraction. And maybe you can tell us how promise theory either does or doesn't shine a light on what is one of the big issues in distributed systems today, which is the trade-off between consistency and scalability. And lots of systems have chosen one form or another of what, what's called eventually consistent. You know, think about people like MongoDB, Cassandra, and one of my current faves, because it's just so cool, Apache's Ignite. Does Promise Theory or your other aspects of your work tell us how we should think about this idea of eventually consistent? Yeah, and this is... Um... I like this topic very much because it is exactly one of those cases where the quantitative, the qualitative, the relativity, and all of these issues come into play for a very concrete, practical purpose. I'll try and not to get get too deep into it. Let's let's see <laughs> let's see if we can start simply first. So th this idea of consistency, first of all, is is the idea that all of the observers in a system, in a distributed system, would always see the same answer when they ask the same question of a particular service. Now, this, of course, would be what we would like to happen because we've, we've constructed computer systems based on the idea that we only had one computer in the beginning. And so, it, it, of course, one computer is always consistent with itself. Um, just as if you read one book, the words aren't changing in front of your eyes. But if you listen to a story from multiple different storytellers as it's being spread through the rumor mill, you might get 20 different answers, um, which might not be consistent at all. So this is not good because you would like uh, computers to be reliable, um, especially if, it, if it's your money that's involved in, in the bank and so on. Um, but of course, we believe very much in this notion of truth in the modern world, no matter how, how naive that might be. So we want simple answers to simple questions. Of course, what Einstein showed us is that different observers will tend to see different answers depending on all kinds of different uh, reasons associated with the channel between the sender and the receiver. It could be because there's a finite speed of communication so updates that are made from one source take longer to propagate to some listeners than to others. So the time at which uh, a listener or a reader tries to ask a question might be critical to the answer that they get. And as I mentioned earlier, may actually influence the order in which they see certain events. So if somebody is trying to resolve a question about... Um, do you owe interest to the bank because your account was overdrawn? Um, you're interested in knowing, did I pay the bill before or after I received my paycheck? In other words, was my account overdrawn for a few days or was it actually never overdrawn? The answer to that question might not be resolved in the same way by different observers. So clearly this is an important issue. Of course, it's also a performance issue, right? Yes. The tighter you try to make that uh, or how, the, the minimize the relativity of views, the more expensive by an exponential, it turns out, it is to maintain a large scale distributed system. So there's, you know, sort of a highest level design perspective of how long does eventually consistent mean? So how big can the relativity be? Exactly. And, and where scale comes in is, is in the, the distance and therefore the time it takes to make that measurement. And also the amount of data that need to be transmitted because obviously it takes a longer amount of time to equilibrate or, or make consistent a larger amount of data than a smaller amount of data. And again, for our readers, the, uh, this is especially critical for databases because the process by which databases are maintained and made consistent is drastically more inefficient than the process by which 
databases can be queried. And the reason for that is they have to be serialized in order to get things in the right order. And serialization leads to single-threaded, very slow-moving queues that tend to build up and resolve very quickly, like traffic jams in the internet. And then there's these two philosophies, one called absolute consistency or acid consistency, and this countervening base consistency or eventual consistency that that says, okay, we're going to respond to you very quickly, um, but the answer you get might not be exactly the same as you hear from someone else. Deal with it. It's It's up to you as an independent observer to deal with it. That would be a kind of a promise-based approach because it's putting the responsibility onto the receiver to resolve that inconsistency themselves because they have that control to be able to do so. The alternative is this absolute consistency at the source, which tries to make it an obligation on all of the potential suppliers of that that little cartel, if you like, of servers that that are, are promising the information. They'd all better be consistent or else. And the only way that they can promise that is to check with each other all of the time whether or not they have the same information uh, in spite of all of the possible changes that may be coming in from all over the place. And that requires them to talk to everybody else in a kind of an N-squared process. For the mathematical people in the audience, you can talk, N clients can talk to a single server in time of order N, But if N servers are trying to talk to everybody else in the network, it takes something of order N squared or N times N to do that, which is much, much slower. Yep, get a thousand servers, it's a million, right? Exactly. And so the the number of servers that you can have to replicate your data is very, very small. It's uh, typically three to seven is the the rule of thumb. And it's an odd number for for other reasons. Um, But that's typically the rule of thumb that people can can expect to wait a, an acceptable amount of time in order to equilibrate those data before giving a request. And even, you know, seven is already slow. The Googles of the world, because they have these ultra fast networks and fast servers can get away with that for very small amounts of data. But whenever your amount of data gets large, you can forget about that consistency and you're really then stuck with so-called eventual consistency. And of course, that's the model which is used by all of the social media companies because they have such enormous amounts of data that they have no hope of being able to make it uh, strictly consistent. Yeah, and of course, semantically, you have to think about the semantics. For many uh, you know, applications in the world, the level of consistency is not very important. You know, for example, if I'm looking at a toaster on Amazon and I want to know how many stars it has, right? My usual rule of thumb is don't buy it unless it has four and a half stars, right? Whether that information is one minute or even one hour is old doesn't really matter to me making my decision as long as the N is bigger, bigger than 100 is the usual number I use. So in which case, the semantics of consistency would say, doesn't matter much. You know, so do your best job. And if all viewers of Amazon even have an hour window of slop about the star rating on a given toaster, it doesn't matter. On the other hand, the example you gave, you know, the, the order in which uh, debits and credits are done on a bank uh, ledger, well, for some applications, it needs to be real time. It's not that many, but uh, you know, again, eventual consistency in time for you know, calculating fees is probably where the semantics comes in. Uh, so one has to be smart in thinking about what you're trying to accomplish when one thinks about these things. Exactly right. And again, coming back to your point at the beginning, Jim, um, about why are physicists, uh, why do we have um, a role to play in IT? I think in physics, we're, we're taught from the very beginning to assume uncertainty in measurements and to deal with it by statistical means or by repeating experiments again and again and, and building up uh, a picture over time to take into account the uncertainties, but there's no culture of this in computer science. Computer science was built around this idea of logic, true or false. The answer is either one thing or it's not. There is no in-between. There's no uncertainty or no variability, no multiplicity, if you will, no plurality of, of answers that you can get. But this is turning out to be entirely untenable in a world at scale, the kind of world that we were talking about in the cloud, where 
the measurement outcome of a measurement is now looking again a bit like quantum mechanics. It could collapse to any one of a number of different values depending on how and exactly when that collapse takes place. So this is an area where physics can really contribute to designing systems because we can build in uncertainty as we have to in causal models of physical phenomena to take into account that scaling of, of causality in a way which computers simply can't do. I have a, I mean, a funny story about this as well. I mean, it's almost, an, it was a bit of, I was a bit embarrassed by it, but the, one of my colleagues at the university had just graduated his PhD and it had been in the subject of object orientation. And object orientation is one of those philosophies in computer science it actually comes from Oslo. So I should probably be careful what I say about this. Um, but uh, it's a, a, a top-down philosophy that tries to organize classes of data according to types and related activities. But it's basically an obligation model. And they, they were having this uh, resolution problem a case in which object orientation was absolutely unable to resolve an obligation inconsistency. And he asked me what I thought of this problem using promise theory. Could, it, could anything, could I come up with an answer for this? And we sketched around on the blackboard for a few minutes and I, I simply drew a bunch of agents and the promises they made to one another and how to resolve the inconsistency locally as we were just discussing and actually solved the problem in about five minutes. And, and this poor guy sat down and he was absolutely flummoxed because he'd literally spent three years on this problem trying to solve it using the logic of obligations. And they'd found a workaround which was potentially unacceptable, but it was a possible problem associated with this subject oriented model. And literally by turning the thing from top down to bottom up or local, we were able to solve the problem in five minutes on the blackboard. That's amazing. Today, we would call this the service-oriented architecture. So service-oriented computing has now come in uh, in a big way, and you're seeing this in microservices and all of these things hear about on the net. But in a way, you could say that's the legacy of promise theory to turn the, the picture upside down from top down to bottom up uh, in a way that allows you to resolve these, these inconsistencies. Oh, well, that's wonderful. Uh, let's now turn from promise theory applied to computing to some other topics. But before we do that, I'm going to jump back and hit two things from our previous discussion. The first is that you pointed out the ontic logic uh, has not been very satisfying in terms of actually useful results, particularly people try to apply it in AI, you know, and ended up in dead ends. But there's a, another alternative that uh, Ben Gertzel, I mentioned before, who's actually been on the show before, has developed called probabilistic logic networks, where he does exactly what you say, is build formally into his logic formalism the sense that every logical statement is uncertain in, in a couple of different ways. And he's finding that to actually be quite useful. Any thoughts about whether that sounds reasonable? Absolutely. And this is actually taking us into the, into the area of uh, AI now and, and machine learning and whatnot. Going back to the late 90s when I was building CF Engine and this computer immunology study, I came up with the idea that we really needed to learn the patterns of behavior in systems in real time. And one way to do that was to gather information, get the machine to learn its own behavior and and try to look for patterns within that over time. When you do that, when you're basically learning, this is called unsupervised learning. It's, it's real-time learning without some kind of pre-trained curation of information up front. So it's really trying to figure stuff out as you go along, fly by the seat of your pants, if you will. And um, when you build, when you learn in that way, you're building up a picture which is longitudinal in the probabilities. You're measuring data a bit like when you're doing polling for an election or something. You're seeing changes in real time and you're aggregating the results in time, longitudinally, one after the other, like a queue. Um, that's, that's not what we normally do in probabilities and it's not what we do in statistical mechanics in physics or in probability theory. What you tend to do there is to aggregate data transversely or over space rather than time. 
So you look for a bunch of equivalent instances that you can compare, which are running in parallel. And you'll say, I want to compare myself to this or to that, and then build my notion of what's normal or not normal uh, based on multiple instances. So for example, in biology, you have all these redundant cells, and you'll be looking at uh, looking at them all and saying, this is normal. Or when there's a cancer cell, that one's that one's not normal. It's definitely got a different signature than these other guys. So the way you aggregate data and form a, a, what we call an ensemble to or a body of data to, to form your body of certainty, as it were, the way you aggregate that is important with if you do it in time or in space or longitudinally or transversely. Um, if you're a service-oriented system, you have no choice but to do this longitudinally. And if you're learning to adapt to a process in real time, again, if you're a robot or some some visual learning system, again, this is data that are arriving longitudinally in time rather than in space. But if you're, if you're trying to pre-train a, a deep learning network or something of this nature based on big data that you've accumulated over time, then this is more analogous to the process of evolution where you've got multiplicities of, uh, of similar agents in an environment responding in different ways. And you're looking at a statistical distribution in space um, and looking for the truth uh, from a population rather than from an adaptive singular system. You see what I mean? I like it. These are two very different perspectives on the world, which now people, of course, getting terribly muddled about in, in AI, uh, believing that uh, systems, these monoscale neural networks, uh, deep learning networks that are basically a single scale fabric and will be therefore capable of responding to a single scale phenomenon. If you want to try to adapt that to make a multi-scale phenomenon, such as you might do with big data across um, something tuned uh, over an evolutionary period of time over multiple timescales, you're going to find that to be extremely inefficient. And you have to have an enormous number of machines, a huge amount of nodes, and it will be incredibly wasteful. And the time it will take will probably be extremely silly. For, for want of a better word. I think that ties in a little bit with this, this result people like to quote about Turing machines being able to simulate any kind of system. You know, Turing had this famous theorem that said that a Turing ma machine can simulate any kind of uh, a computation, no matter what it is, whether it's a brain or what. Of course, he didn't say how long it would take. So you might be able to simulate using a Turing machine and a deep learning network any kind of process, but it might take you a thousand years to do what a human does in a split second. So trying to impose multi-scale phenomena on a single scale process is going to mess up your reasoning and your time scales. This is one of my hobby horses, which if you like comes out of promise theory, but it's 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 a feature of any kind of the dynamical system. Your guys at Santa Fe know all about this because multi-scale systems, each scale making its own promises, if you like, or having its own special interactions, are exactly what the characteristic of uh, complex systems. And this is exactly why deep learning will never be more than something like an eyeball or an ear, a smart sensor, uh, rather than a, an entire thinking cognitive system. I love that because I agree 100 percent. Deep learning, while miraculous, I mean, it's amazing the results they're finding. I think in the end, on the road to artificial general intelligence, we will think of deep learning much like perceptual systems as opposed to, you know, the real thinking that gets done in other stages. Let's move on to a very quick discussion of another thing that you talked about in passing. One of my favorite bugaboos, free will. Frankly, I've come around to the view that free will isn't even worth talking about. It just seems to me to be in a confused muddle and people use it in such different ways that there really isn't any value in talking about free will. Do you have any, any thoughts on that? I do. Um, and again, I think this is where philosophers have really gone off the rails. 
they have this kind of, I mean, you remember back in Victorian times, we had this ladder, all the species yep, yep. going all the way up, up to gods. And of course, mankind is next to God. This is uh, one of those unhelpful things where we try to set humans apart from the other species. I like this idea that uh, we can understand cognitive systems as from a scaling perspective, going all the way down to a single atom that can see a photon, absorb it, change its energy level, and emit the photon again. If you like passing on the information, yep, I absorb the photon. That would be perhaps the simplest cognitive system you could imagine. It has both a sensor, it can receive information. It has the memory to remember that bit of information by its energy level changing. And it can adapt to that, uh, that change of information. You can go on scaling that from molecules to cells to single-celled organisms to multi-cell organisms to humans and so on and so on, up, up, up and up and up. And with increasing amounts of memory and increasing specificity of a sensory apparatus, you can semantically and dynamically scale that process up and end up with a human brain. And, and I wrote a book this year called Smart Space Time to try to explain how a consistent story around that scaling is not difficult to write down. I mean, there's a degree of speculation involved, obviously, but there are bits of evidence as well that we can rely on, like the Dunbar hierarchy, for instance, of for our readers, Robin Dunbar was a, an anthropological psychologist, actually, I believe, originally from Liverpool University, he's now at Oxford, who studied the primates, not, not the religious primates, but the, on the, on the ladder to God, but the, the, uh, the monkey primates like, like us, uh, and the sizes of their brains, and he showed this straight line relationship between the size of the, the neocortex or the, the reasoning part of the brain and the size of social groups that animals live in. And he showed that this, the, the amount of processing capacity, memory, and analysis that goes on inside the brain is basically related to the size of the social group that we're able to call our friends or to have a to have a relationship with. And a relationship is not just, yes, I friended you on Facebook. It's it's an interactive, trust-building interaction in the Robert Axelrod uh, mode of exchanging, like playing a dilemma game to see who, whether you, yes, I keep my promises. No, you don't. Do I trust you? No, I don't. This takes some time to, to build up. And so obviously it, it requires some memory to remember those interactions. So more memory, more socials, groups, more trust, and so on. And he also showed that uh, the depth of the relationship is important. So with a human brain, my brain can manage about the size of a family for a really close-knit relationship that I know really well. But at the level of working together, we can handle maybe 30-odd people. And at the level of sort of sending a Christmas card every year at Christmas, we can handle up to about 150 people. So with the same processing capacity, we can do different jobs in different amounts of detail, depending on how much computation is required. And that, again, is an important constraint factor on the kind of scaling that you can do in any kind of learning system from atom to, to brain. Now, coming back to free will, um, I think if you if you remember at the beginning, I said this way of defining intent as simply a possible outcome. When you get to a certain scale, the number of possible outcomes that you can foresee because you have learned of the many possible things that can happen in a cognitive network, a semantic network, they become really quite large. And so you may have the illusion of free will simply by having many possible choices that you can foresee as being rational outcomes by um, having feedback within a brain, if you will, or a cognitive agent. What I found uh, interesting from this simple model of cognition and memory, so in other words, a cognitive system being something that receives input through some kind of a sensor and has some memory and is able to divide memory and by essentially smart discriminators, 
And these smart discriminators are honed by evolution over long, long timescales. So vision and movement and place and direction and even faces apparently have a specific so-called hardwired circuitry. Those discriminators can then form a, a, a reasonably organized network in a memory system. Let's call it a brain for want of a better expression. And then when the senses are switched on, it can reason in a certain way which is constrained by the outer world. And if you switch off those senses, like when we're asleep, you'll see a different kind of a story being told uh, on the brain through dreaming, which is based on the same set of memories within the brain or within the memory system being pieced together with different possible outcomes. And then, of course, things go a bit haywire because there's no external criteria to set a sense of time. So our brains use their own sense of time to piece things together and their own sort of uh, resolution uh, mechanisms like emotional resolution uh, to piece together storylines. And I find this notion of stories to be extremely compelling in these cognitive systems in around the idea of consciousness. I think that uh, if we ever figure out what consciousness is, we're basically looking at whatever it is in the brain that pieces together stories in a timeline. Because even when we're asleep, we experience the sense of time, and yet we just have random access memories. And if you store a bunch of data in a database, in your Oracle database or your MongoDB database, it doesn't suddenly turn into a story or a sense of time. Um, that has to be constructed by some ongoing process, extracting pieces, characters, and forcing them into a storyline, even without external sensory stuff going on. So in order to have this sort of illusion of free will and consciousness and these related issues, I suspect, of course, this is pure speculation, but I suspect that these things will simply emerge naturally once we have a sufficiently large multi-scale semantic network, which is informed by data from the outside, but at the same time can reason on the inside through these feedback loops and um, using a, a, an independent process, possibly several if you have multiple personality disorder, right? So multiple storylines going on at the same time. This, this could be the way that we understand those issues. Yeah, that's what actually, if I have a day job, which I don't really, it is the stu scientific study of consciousness. And my own theories would be essentially, at least partially parallel, in that episodic memories are absolutely critical. And as far as we know, there are pointers between episodes. So there is an implicit timeline built into the, uh, you know, the memory structure of reasonably advanced animals. We're not quite sure where the line is. So that's interesting. I think it's time to move on a little bit here. You've mentioned you've applied promise theory to city scaling, you know, along the lines of the work of Louis Betancourt and Jeffrey West. Uh, could you say more about that? Yeah, you know, I had the most amazing uh, coincidence. I was, I was in New York for a conference and I met Jeffrey West for the first time, uh, which is amazing because actually we, we discovered we only have one degree of separation between us. I think it was Mark Heinmarsh, a mutual friend, but we'd never met. And I had no idea what he was going to talk about. He had no idea what I was going to talk And he never heard my talk because he left early. But I listened to his talk about cities scaling and was just fascinated because I realized he was giving almost the same talk that I was going to give, just on, with a different focus. And I went home and I, I started to download all of his papers. I spent my Christmas that year literally working through all of the papers that he wrote about um, scaling in biological systems and then with Louis Betancourt on <clears throat> scaling in cities. And I reproduced uh, Louis's model for deriving the universal scaling in cities. And then I rederived the whole thing using promise theory because I figured that um, although these, these universal scaling stories are nice, they don't really reveal what the mechanisms are. In fact, they somehow actively cover up what those mechanisms are. And I was interested in mechanisms because I'm more of a hands-on kind of guy, I suppose. So, um, and I really, I mean, Luis did all the work, but uh, just applying the additional few bits and pieces that are, that are in promise theory that are not in ordinary network thinking, 
allowed me to come up with a couple of ideas about how might this apply to a different kind of network rather than a city. And again, you know, thinking of cloud computing, because that's that's where I normally work in my day job, if you will, mere mortals like myself have no access to the data from the big cloud companies, right? Because I don't work for Google, I don't work for Facebook, and they don't share with the other children. So we don't have access to that data. They they have a monopoly on that. So I, I began to wonder, you know, these guys from Santa Fe had done an amazing job of acquiring data about cities from all of these obscure sources and putting together a picture. And I wondered if some of those data might have similarities with the kinds of networks that you would see in, in a computer, for instance, rather than the networks in a city. Just by generalizing the argument to different kinds of networks, could I infer what kind of scaling you might see in a computer network? And I did something around that. So I actually wrote a paper on that. I sent it to Luis, and he was generous in giving me some comments, but we were actually both way too busy and, and had to move on to other things. I don't think either of us ever, ever followed up on that stuff. I, I saw he just posted a very interesting new paper about cities in China, which I started to read. So I'm still interested in that stuff because I work a little bit on smart cities from time to time. But uh, there are so many interesting cases where, again, multi-scale phenomena and network science play a role. And I think promise theory can inform a lot of those discussions. Cool. Another area you've at least commented on a little bit is applications of promise theory to agile, both at the group level and at the organizational level. What can you tell us about promise theory and agile? Yeah, again, another amazing uh, uh, coincidence. Our apparently mutual friend, Daniel Mezik, wrote a book called um, Leadership by Invitation, I believe is the title, in which he mentioned promise theory and he, he let me know that he had mentioned, he'd used promise theory in his book, uh, inviting leadership by invitation. So of course I got the book, I read it and I thought, oh, this is, this is pretty interesting stuff. Um, and I'd always had this idea that I wanted to use promise theory at the scale of not just quantum mechanics, computers, organisms, biology, but it's society as, and social interactions as a potential network as well. And of course, teams and companies and organizations have some kind of dynamics of their own. Actually, even Jeffrey West has done some work on that on a different level. But I, I thought, what could I do to apply promises directly using my algebra of cooperation uh, to Daniel's work? And he'd, uh, he'd brought up this issue of boundaries, where the interesting boundaries are in a system, and how that influences the cooperation between individuals and companies and so on. This is a pretty interesting topic on all levels, you know, where is exactly the boundary of a system? Think of an organism, even, you know, biological organism, I we're all shedding cells, <laughs> hairs and cells around us every day, and all the dust in our apartments is basically bits of us that have fell off. If I spit on the street, is that still part of me? Um, it's got my DNA, right? So it's labeled with my, the promise of me is in that little lump of spit, but it's it's no longer able to feed back on the process that I conventionally think of as, as me. So do, do I call it me or not me? If you don't mind, I'm going to jump in here because I have a yeah. strong theory about this. It comes up all the time on what is me, right? And this goes all the way back to conversations in middle school, right? And so what I've just decided for practical purposes is what is me is those sets of cells that are actively engaged in the homeostasis network around the transfer of gases, nutrients, and toxins. You know, I think I actually came to this realization after reading Jeffrey's book on scale and some of his papers on biological scaling, because it seems to me there's a qualitative difference between those cells which are getting oxygen in, carbon dioxide out, nutrients in, and toxins out on the order of a couple seconds 
versus those that don't. And that allows you to make pretty strong distinctions. For instance, our fingernails are not me by that theory, and nor is our hair. But the follicles for the hair are, because they're still in this real-time homeostasis around gases, foods, and toxins. So I'll just throw that out as at least one way to think about what is me. I like that. Uh, so in your view, is are the several kilos of bacteria in our gut part of me or not? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that's they're adjacent to me, right? Ah, the adjacent possible me. <laughs> exactly, right? Because they're not exactly tied into these homeostasis networks, but they're utterly dependent upon it. Well, and there's some controversy about that as well, right? Uh, they may or may not be uh, tied into those networks in ways that we're not quite sure about. Yeah, but, but probably indirectly rather than directly. They're not literally mm. plugged in through capillaries, pulling gases in and yeah. pushing gases out. But one level of indirection. So that's actually a wonderful example that will make me go back and rethink my ideas. So anyway, let's you get back to uh, your discussion about Agile and PT. Yeah. No, I, I like your characterization. And, and the promise idea, I think, feeds very nicely into that um, way of agents interacting and the autonomy of the agents and, and where they come together. And the thing that promise theory kind of points out is that the default state of any agent, if you will, is a, a, an autonomous state where f basically free to do whatever we want, hunter gathering in the forest. Um, but if we want to come together in a corporation, a social corporation, we basically voluntarily give up some of that freedom by promising to behave in a certain way, promising to deliver, which which constrains us in, in a little bit. It, it eliminates a little bit of that, that um, freedom to do anything that we want. Um, and so, of course, we can talk about this uh, fascination. We have obsession with freedom of speech and so on in the West. And you, of course, you're free to say whatever you want. It might not be wise, but, um, you know, just I remember <laughs> the only advice I ever got from my, my high school teacher for my university exams was just whatever you do, don't tell them to fuck off. <laughs> well, uh, well, I violate that one all the time. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yes, of course, we, we limit our freedom and we do it by the promises we offer when we offer ourselves. And the, with this discussion I had with Daniel was to apply this to the notions like providing services to one another in a business. What does it mean to have authority over others, given that agents start out basically free and autonomous? that turns out to, have to be related to a notion of symbiosis because you can try to impose authority on others by attack, if you like, by actually trying to overwhelm another agent. But normally we do it by a cooperative means, by delegating a mandate to cooperate and sort of a mandate for leadership and, and accepting that, man shape, that mandate for leadership. And that goes to the point of rights and whether or not we have rights, a kind of permission, which is the promise to be able to access or to do something that I control and you don't. And there's even uh, this thing came out of it called the downstream principle, which is who is basically most responsible for an outcome happening if you have a chain of ser a service chain or a, a logistics chain, if you like, an end-to-end -end delivery. You can try to blame the same, you know, if you order something from Amazon and it doesn't arrive on time, do you blame Amazon? Do you blame the postman? Or do you blame yourself for not having it on time? What promise theory kind of says is, is interesting. It says you can blame Amazon a little bit if you like, but it's not too much use. Uh, you can blame the postman a little bit more because uh, he's closer to you. But you are the one who ultimately has the autonomy to do something about getting that book and if it didn't arrive on time, you could go and buy it from someone else. So you, the farther downstream you are, the closer you are to the recipient of a promise in a chain of, of delegated promises, the more responsibility you have for the outcome. And that also makes an interesting point that if you ultimately try to blame someone else, the only reason for blaming someone else is because you didn't keep your own promise to find the, the, a source for that resolution somewhere else. So these, these ways of applying promises to leadership had some pretty interesting insights, I think, and ways of 
truth telling, if you will, about uh, organizations and management structures. I find that quite fascinating. And I continue to work with Daniel on putting together some training for people in business. Well, let's make a, a real call out to Daniel Mezik for being the person who nominated Mark to be on the show. Thank you a lot, Daniel. This has been a very uh, productive conversation. Talking about leadership, I recorded a podcast yesterday with Jamie Wheel, and he is involved with a group called Game B, which I'm also associated with to a greater or lesser degree, which thinks about very non-traditional forms of social operating systems at all scales from the small to the large. And one of the ideas he talked about yesterday is one that's practiced by the U.S. Navy SEALs, the elite military unit, called dynamic subordination where there are no leaders or there are are anomaly leaders being the Navy, people have rank, but when the SEALs are out in combat, nobody has power based on their position. It's a very rapidly evolving dynamic situation where people take role-based leadership, sometimes just for seconds. And then the team is so well coordinated that they transition in real time from one role-based leader to another, and they call this whole thing dynamic subordination. Any thoughts that strike you about that idea? I love that idea. Um, and first of all, this this idea of game B that I learned about this through you from your, from your podcast, very interesting, absolutely up my alley. This idea of role-based leadership and role-based uh, activities in a cooperative network is exactly bang on for, for promise theory. Um, and this notion of military... Voluntary subordination is one of the examples I use again and again in my book because, you know, many people will often object to this idea of uh, voluntary cooperation and uh, autonom- fundamental sort of default state of autonomy in agents by saying, yeah, but that's not how society works. You basically tell people what to do and that's what happens. And look at the military, the, the most successful system in in the world or whatever. And, and you point out that, of course, people in the military have a very ordered um, hierarchy of command and control often, which is designed to maintain a, f- a semantic stability and an operational stability in operational terms. But, of course, the roles, who gets to decide, may be changing on a basis of whether or not you can actually communicate or not. So that delegated authority and the roles, as you mentioned, is exactly the right analogy for a a dynamical system. Uh, And of course, it's exactly what happens in biology with with different cells taking the lead on different processes as certain things come in and out of play. The immune system, a great example, so that um, most of the time the immune system is pretty inert and other systems are are, are calling the shots. But but when an antigen is detected that is um, unpleasant or whatever, a response will be mounted and certain other systems come into play, taking a lead role on things like heart rate and temperature and so on. And similarly in computer systems, multi-scale systems in computing, this notion of so-called microservices, where individual services may be determining specific outcomes on a case-by-case basis, um, depending on what the particular scenario is uh, taking place and whatever context we're in. I think we had an interaction through Twitter the other day about biases in data-based decision-making systems and whether different biases are actually important in determining, in discriminating different contexts for decision-making or whether they're in fact things to be eliminated. And I I think you and I had this view that biases are actually the mechanism by which uh, we make decisions. And in a human, for instance, I've always had this view that we will never understand intelligence or real or artificial without understanding the role that emotions play in resolving when things are determined or not determined. Basically, my idea of when we have a a good explanation for something or a proper outcome or a proper decision, when we're happy with that decision, it's whether or not we have an emotional response which is favorable or whether we feel like we need to keep going because we're fearful and uncertain. Tell me why, you know, this thing is true. 
like kids tell, yeah, but why, Daddy? Why, Daddy? And they, well, it's because of this. No, but why is that true? Oh, it's because of this other thing. No, but why is that true? And eventually you give up, right? You simply give up because there's an infinite chain you could go down, but you will feel either exhausted or, or happy to receive a particular answer, and that's when you stop. That's your go-to explanation. So the ultimate resolution of logic is emotional. And that's why I think logic will never be the, the basis for intelligence. It's why without this multi-scale approach to, and this approximate, very fast, you know, system one and system two in Daniel Kahneman's language, this fast resolution, this emotional resolution is in fact the ultimate arbiter of decisions in spite of all the possible semantic pathways that may be selected by our neocortical uh, reasoning processes. So that's that's my long answer to your simple question. Yeah, I, I love it because it's actually something I'm, I'm a strong believer in and actually in my own work I, uh, I use this. And that is even in system two, it turns out that emotion is the final adjudicator. You build multiple competing models and it's frankly your emotions that tip you to choose A or B or C as this well thought out, carefully articulated thinking we thought, but it's not really true. But point people to one of the, I think, fundamental books for people thinking about consciousness and how it relates to the organization organism, the ape with clothes that we really are. And that's called The Feeling of What Happens, Body and Emotion in the Making of Consciousness by Antonio Damasio. Uh, the book's a little dated from 2000 in the field of consciousness studies. That's old. But it's a book that I would really point people to who are interested in understanding quite deeply how the body and emotion are utterly involved in our consciousness in every single possible way. So I think I think we're on the same page there. Let's move on a little bit. We could talk about consciousness forever, but my list is still too long. <laughs> uh, so I want to go uh, turn to the next big topic. You know, some of your uh, thinking has returned to your roots in physics, and you saw an isomorphism, more or less, between promise theory and space-time which you developed into semantic space-time. In fact, you uh, yeah. wrote a cool book called Smart Space-Time. In fact, a quick look at that book convinced me that Daniel Mezek was right. This was a smart guy worth talking to. Tell us about Smart Space-Time. Yeah, I mean, this was another one of those stories that actually came out of that uh, digression through cities and networks. And, and over the years, I've discovered that more and more of these phenomena that we're seeing in the cloud and in cities and, and so on implicates a reasoning which is based on the notion of things being next to one another, being directly adjacent, being able to communicate, or being in sequence to one another in time, where time is in fact just changes that happen. Basically, it's the, the, it's the sequence of changes that happen um, is what we mean by a clock in, in in Einstein's meaning. And, and so uh, this idea of space and time was always in the back of my mind as being conspicuously present in, in many of these explanations of an abstract way. And being a physicist, I, I recognize these things. Uh, we are taught to think about space and time these days in terms of symmetry. So in physics, um, symmetry plays a large role and we talk about the symmetry of translations or, or linear motion and the symmetry of rotations about different axes, so like the Earth turning on its axes. If you you know you rotate it and it looks the same like a ball, then we say that's a symmetry of, of rotation. If you move something and you can't really see that it's moved because there's nothing to compare it to, you'd say that's a symmetry of translation. And and the whole of modern physics is based on this notion, this shift in thinking towards symmetry in space and time. But what I realized in these discrete networks that I deal with every day in computer science is that that idea is not going to fly in computer science. First of all, because at the scale of the networks we have, there is no large scale order, what we call long range order in physics. There's no large scale translational invariance. In other words, on a long, long scale, you don't see any uniformity. Things are pretty muddled up and messy still. But as the cloud gets bigger and bigger and bigger, we eventually find these virtual forms of uniformity uh, 
So you can move a virtual machine from one physical machine to another, and you can't tell the difference. That's a form of translation invariance in the cloud. You can reorganize or reconnect to different uh, servers. We were just talking about uh, eventual consistency. You could flip your server from Asia to America, for instance, and, and you would not see any difference, and that would be a kind of rotational invariance. So there are these analogs between these invariances or covariances that we see in physics and the changes that we can apply in computer science. And I wondered if it might be possible to formalize some of that using promise theory. So I I set about doing this. I sat down with my little pen and paper, and I I literally do work with a fountain pen and a a moleskin book when I do my work. And I I started trying to rediscover space-time but using the networks uh, and promise theory, thinking of the points in space as individual agents and the connections between them being based on the promises that they make to one another. And this connected immediately with Shannon's notion of the communications channel, sender and receiver, which only takes you halfway from A to B. And this was already extremely interesting to me because Again, in physics, we have this notion that if A is next to B, then obviously B is next to A. But in information theory and in promise theory, that doesn't have to be true. There's an additional promise that needs to happen in order to get back again, if you've gone from A to B, to go back from B to A. So the the natural, most primitive state of a a space-time, if you will, in other words, of points being next to one another in a network, is for them to be in a a kind of a directed graph, what we call a directed network in in math. And to reconstruct everything that we know and take for granted in physics using a promise theoretic network takes actually a lot of work. It takes a lot, a lot of promises that we take simply for granted in physics. And that is very interesting because it means that there's a whole bunch of things that we ignore in physics that we should be paying attention to. Now imagine like a a leap of of faith, if you will, to one of your earlier guests, uh, Lee Smolin, who who talked a bit about quantum gravity and some of his work about quantum graffiti. He used used this pun on graph theory. Quantum graffiti is the theory of quantum gravity, some of his work with Carlo Rovelli and, and so on, on this loop quantum gravity. This is a model in which uh, space-time at its most fundamental level may be built on points or agents connected together into a network. And in his language, it's a spin network, like Roger Penrose's spin networks. But uh, forgetting about that uh, stuff, just thinking about it as a promise network, a bunch of agents connected with information channels in the notion of Shannon or in the notion of promise theory, then you try to reconstruct space-time, you find a lot of very interesting things pop naturally out at you, like some of the structures in quantum mechanics around the Hermitian structures of predictability and how that might emerge from a a smaller level picture. The reason for um, singularities Um, a whole bunch of topics that we don't have time to go into, but which I found extremely interesting. And I tried to write a little bit about in in my book, Smart Space Time. Then right at the opposite end of that, I read that uh, fascinating book by um, Peter Volleben, The Hidden Life of Trees, about the complex networks in forests between trees as agents and the communications channels they have between them using fungi and various other microorganisms and the interactions they have. And I find this absolutely fascinating to go from the very tiniest things in nature to the very largest things in nature and see essentially a kind of space-time structure in both where the notion of space as memory uh, and time as change allow you to construct a simple model of cognitive agents that are able to think and remember stuff about each other simply by forming cooperative networks. And that's essentially the the short version of my very long book, uh, Smart Space Time.
you know what? I just realized that your perspective is very, very close to one of the five research agendas at the Santa Fe Institute called Complex Time. I'd recommend you take a look at that on their website. And if you feel the same kind of uh, congruence that I do, I'd be happy to introduce you to the director of that project. I think you guys would have something very interesting to talk about. I I would always love to. I'll send you a link to it. And by the way, listeners, we're going to put links up to all the many books that we've talked about here, including, of course, Mark's, but but all the various other ones will be up on the page for Mark's episode. Just go to jimrutshow.com and you'll be able to find links to all these very interesting books. I'm going to do a little bit more chopping on my topic list. One of the areas I personally know a lot about and I'm utterly fascinated with is money, but we do not have time to talk about money. If (laughs) if you're willing, I'd like to get you back on again and talk about money. Sure. But let's switch to a a couple other smaller topics. One that listeners of the Jim Rudd Show know is a regular recurring feature. If I can find any excuse, I work it in with my guests, is talking about the Fermi paradox the Drake equation, and where the hell are all the space aliens? Mark made the big mistake of in an email back and forth indicating that that was a topic he was willing to talk about. So, (laughs) uh, Mark, what do you think about space aliens? I love this topic. I first thought about this because uh, Isaac Asimov got me interested in this. This is his book, Extraterrestrial Civilization. So this is a book I got as a teenager. So I've had this topic on my mind for, for years and years. But I thought about it again recently because I wrote about artificial intelligence in uh, a blog post on my network, on my homepage rather. And I forget the name of the the blog post, but it was basically about scale again, you know, my favorite topic of scale, time scales and spatial scales. And the point I wanted to make was that uh, because I'd been reading all these books about, uh, you know, the the AIs are going to take over, they're going to read all our stuff and become evil and steal our money and run away with civilization and try to kill us. And I thought, hang on, hang on a second. How do we even know that a life form, whether it's a real life form in outer space or or an artificial life form as an AI, would have any sensory apparatus that responds on the same time scale that we do? How would we know that its processes are in any way comparable to ours in order to notice that we even exist. And and the obvious uh, example of that is the case I just gave of the hidden life of trees, uh, Peter Volleben's book, in which we look at a forest, and this is a, a set of life forms that are thinking, reasoning, changing, adapting on a time scale that is so much longer than ours that we literally can't see any of it happening. It looks totally frozen in time to us, and yet there is this living, changing, dynamical network happening over years, millennia, centuries, uh, possibly even millennia, involving organisms on all kinds of scales. And you could make the same uh, accusation of AI. Uh, How do you know that the data an AI, if it evolved, got interested in, and the sensors that it was connected to, explicitly or implicitly that might lead to an emergent intelligence, how do you know that those would be related to our uh, scales, the scales on which we are interested in things? And how would its understanding of the world essentially overlap with ours? I think that may be the key to why we are unable to perceive or see not only life, but dynamical phenomena in the universe, because we are simply ill-equipped on a sensory level or on a reasoning level to think about them on the same time scale or, or spatial scale for that matter. Of course, that leaves two possibilities, which both of which could be true. Things that are way faster than we can perceive. I suppose there is something like life somehow in the corona of the sun with this tremendous energy flux going through it. It may be operating at quantum mechanical time speeds, right? And on the other extreme, you know, take your example of trees and fungus networks and scale it up to something, inter, you know, space, life that lives in interstellar space and reacts on the uh, uh, million year time frame. We would miss both of those. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, we know the answer to the first one because we saw that in Star Trek. It, they, if they're going really fast, they sound like bees. You may remember that episode. 
I don't recall that one. That must be one of them goddamn later ones. I'm, I'm only the first generation Star Trek man. I do not watch the later ones. That would no, be heresy. No, no, no. This, this was Captain Kirk. He fell in love with that bee oh. in the end of this. I'll try and try and dig out that, that, that name. I'll have to find it. <laughs> yeah. The second one, um, definitely interesting. Uh, in my book, actually, also make the point that if you observe phenomena over long, long times, you may actually extract a kind of a space-time picture that looks a little bit like Newtonian mechanics with things like velocities and accelerations and masses explained in terms of the nearest neighbor interactions between those things. And so actually scaling also has an explanation for how Newtonian ideas can emerge from a quantum level, which again is one of those problems that we have no good answer for currently in physics, but it could well be that it's a a figment of scale. Very, very interesting. Well, I think with that very interesting insight, I'm going to call it end here, even though I go on for hours. I'm going to take you up on your agreement to do another session later about mostly money, but I know we're going to get into other stuff too. So I'd really like to thank you, Mark, for one of the most interesting, the most wide ranging episodes we've had so far on the show. Oh, thanks, Jim. Really my pleasure to do it. And um, it's been a huge privilege for me to do it and I love your show all the guests have been amazing I've listened to as many of the podcasts as I possibly can I will continue to do so well thank you very much production services and audio editing by Jared Jane's consulting music by Tom Muller at modern Studio.